today's message is Season of Grief. It's part of the Home for the Holidays series. This is part four. This will be brief today. It will include prayers throughout, however. Thank you for joining. Hope you all are well. Well, we go home for the holidays, but holidays aren't always a happy time. Because holidays and family visits can be very stressful. But there's a a thing that happens after seasonal solstices. It depends on which hemisphere you're in. That the days get shorter and the sun shines less. And this lack of sunshine affects a lot of people negatively. And they get what's called the winter time blues. You know, there's a lull in their spirit over the darker months. And there are a lot of things affecting people seasonally. Things that affect them year round, as a matter of fact, but seasonally and cyclically. And people with the wintertime blues, well, they can really be no fun to be around. But we don't judge them. We pray for them. Our hearts of compassion go out to them. Amen. So being in the sunshine is important for humans. Sunshine is needed to produce vitamin D and sunlight does other good things for the human person, the human body. It helps our state of mind. Forgive the voice today. So there's something physiologically in people, in their bodies that causes blue people to feel blue. But again, I said, we try to understand. So. I ask also, though, is there a spiritual component to the wintertime blues? I mean, really, some people are blue year round. It's not just a lack of sunshine for some. So this message is about grief. And so some people are in grief. They're in grief acutely or some chronically, some perpetually. But spiritually, cyclical and seasonal grief could be programmed grief. It could be programmed into your life. And that's not desirable, of course. But what does it mean? It means that the grief, the grief in your life, in your family's life, may be programmed on your family's calendar. It may be on your family's altar. It could be sent to you by an evil wisher, someone who dabbles in black arts and sends grief to your family cyclically seasonally it may be a person who declares that i don't think they should have another happy christmas or they shouldn't have a happy new year we don't know there are lots of people who want lots of bad things to happen to people who are supposed to be their friends but they're not really friends so this programmed grief could be a result of an evil ancestral covenant or you could have done it yourself knowingly without or unknowingly without even realizing that that's what you did by continuing to rehearse things in a cyclical pattern or seasonally, yearly. You could have programmed yourself, programmed this grief into yourself, into your family. And now it gets into your bloodline because that's what grandma always did or that's what granddad always did. And you think that's normal. You think it's love. So you might be in a family or be a person who you may start moving toward happiness and then another event or an occasion or an anniversary of a negative event comes up and then it's time to be blue again time to be sad again and then your family may embrace this tradition and they may be used to the other shoe dropping all the time more sadness more loss more mourning more grief it could be real and immediate grief it could be necessary grief or it could be rehearsed age old grief and that your family may endure it all together as a family or you may endure it individually it could be expected like i said in your family it could be what you all do it could be what happens in your family it could be the way it's always been because uh the grandparents or ancestors did it this way and you may believe as i said that all this grieving either individually or collectively is love but it's really not love. But you believe that it's how you respect the dead by being sad, by being blue, and it's not. But grieving is way more than just the wintertime blues or seasonal blues. 
And I just bring that up, the seasonal blues, just for your consideration. Some people have the blues, as I said, because their nutrients actually missing from their body. And if that's addressed, then the blues are gone and you're living a normal life again. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, you are Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, my healer. I know that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And you know everything about me. You know how it all works. I ask you, Lord, for divine healing in every system of my body so that I can be healed, made whole, and able to serve you and my family in the best way possible. Lord, give me wisdom to make wise dietary and exercise choices for optimum health. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering my prayers in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, the social media way of handling losses is to wish happy birthday on the earth birth date of the deceased, for instance, acknowledging that they are in heaven. Amen. And since the dead know nothing, Ecclesiastes 9.5, I'm sure this act is for the living. So I Googled this. Google says that celebrating birthdays is a pagan tradition. A bunch of religions don't even allow the celebration of birthdays. However, in this message, we're not talking about births or just about births. We're talking about people who celebrate the date of a person's death by going into grief, by mourning over and over again that same time of year. And it's been made into a family tradition. It's been programmed into their seasons. Could be one of the reasons why you must go home for the holidays or it could be one of the reasons why it's hard to go home for the holidays. As I said, either the family collectively programmed this into the family's event, or maybe you started it on your own or in your own home or in your own family. But this grief is real. It is real, even if it's programmed and you have these commemorations in your family or in your home, but it's like having the wake and the funeral every year. And that's the way to stay in and increase the grief in your life. Too much grief and prolonged grief in anybody's life is dangerous, it's damaging, it's devastating, it's even sinful. And while it is dishonoring to forget the deceased, it is a curse to have one's name cut off from the earth. It is a curse to be forgotten and remembered no more in the earth. But the deceased, your lost loved one, cannot be promoted in death to celebrity status. Balance must be had in all things. And we should let our moderation show. Philippians 4.4 So in the case of a lost parent, for instance, or a spouse, I actually, I know people who begin their mourning and their grief process at least about a week out from the deceased person's birthday or their date of their death or their wedding anniversary date or Mother's Day or Father's Day or Christmas or Thanksgiving or Resurrection Sunday or their own birthday or the birth dates of their own children, Memorial Day, Veterans Day, if the person served in the military, Fourth of July and Labor Day. And if there's a memory of summer vacation or summer family cookouts, add that in and add in any special days that they shared that are not even known holidays with anyone else, such as a first date, the engagement date, and other sentimental occasions. By my count, that's about 20 or more weeks of intermittent planned grief in a year with 52 weeks. That's about half the year. And this doesn't include any new or unexpected grief. I'm saying this to get you, any of us, to look at how much grief we are entertaining in a year's time and how that could be unhealthy for us, how it could also be sin. Stay tuned to this message. So all grief that is programmed into my life, Lord, either seasonally, cyclically, regularly, Lord, let it be broken. Let that programming be broken by the blood of Jesus now. In the name of Jesus, amen. 
planned grief and constant memorials unless God told you to do it. They establish, if God told you to do it, to establish a memorial to him. If not, it all of those planned grief is not honoring God. And it's also not honoring your deceased loved one because they know nothing about it. And God has not called you to call that person to celebrity status now that they are gone. Recently, I saw a movie. And in this movie, there were a set of twins. They were born and one twin was kidnapped from the hospital. This is at the birth. So the story opens with a very sad 16 year old girl who's she's very sad because it's her birthday. But in reality, the parents are going to overshadow her birthday by commemorating the lost child rather than celebrating the one they have. And actually there's a son too, he's younger. So in celebrating the two children that they have, but it is the 16 year old's birthday. Instead of commemorating her birthday, celebrating it, they're commemorating the lost child. So the entire family, including the birthday girl, is sad, miserable. In essence, they've idolized the lost child. We have a prayer now against idolatry. Lord, I know that idolaters will not inherit the kingdom of God. I do not want to miss heaven or grieve you in any way, Lord. I repent in the name of Jesus for anything or any person I put ahead of you. I repent for spending more time, thought, energy, resources, or love on anything or anyone living or dead than on you. Lord, forgive me and wash me clean now and renew a right spirit in me. In the name of Jesus, amen. Tidings of comfort and joy. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Luke 2.10 Tidings of comfort and great joy. Comfort and joy is not just for Christmas. It's for the entire year, all year. Whether you're expected to come home for the holidays or not, it is for your life. Because the life can be hard. Sometimes it can be devastating and we all need comfort and we all need joy in our lives. We need it in our house, in our workplace, in our world. But this message is not just about Christmas or the holidays. It is about Jesus being born into your heart. Amen. Jesus being the Lord of your life. But while it is about loss and disappointment and memories, and some of those memories are sad, it's about the new year. It's about every year, all year. It's about the New Year's Eve that you spent with a loved one who's either gone on to glory, gone from the earth, or gone just from your life. It is about the New Year's Eve that you didn't get to spend with somebody that you dearly wanted to spend it with. It is about the New Year's Eve party that you went to with that special, special someone. But that was the last time you two were together as a couple. Or at all friend all these things have happened to me you're not alone and this message is about Jesus being born into your heart and it's about the comfort of the Holy Spirit coming into your life so that New Year's Day is about the next day New Year's Day when there was perhaps disappointment and perhaps a feeling that there was nothing to look forward to and it's about the days and the weeks following where the sun did or didn't shine. But it seemed it didn't shine in your world. It's about the anticipation in your heart, how it had ebbed or reached a solstice, making it seem like the sun was not even sufficient to even shine on you. It's about days you spent alone or disappointed that you couldn't get a date for special occasions. Or that time you didn't get an engagement ring when you thought you were going to get one. It's about the grief of those times. It's about no springtime surprises, no chocolate bunnies and decorated baskets. It's about missed birthdays or birthdays where that special someone was no longer with you or even with the entire family. It's about the anniversary of that day 
that keeps happening, repeated, being repeating itself on the calendar. The calendar now that just has X's on it. Which day? It's either the happiest day of your life up till now or the saddest day in your memory. It's about that missed or best anniversary ever. It's about the birthday that no one remembered. It's about the birthday that you always treasured. And you're afraid that people will forget someone that was very important to you, even if they passed on 10, 15, 20 years ago. So you keep posting it and reposting it online and in your heart and in your mind, in your soul. It is about relationship losses, family losses, life losses. That's what this message is about. It's about the turkey dinner that's not the same or the pecan pie that a store bought this year instead of homemade because nobody knows how to make it like grandma. And it's even, it's about not even wanting to put up the holiday lights and wreaths because what's the use? But it's the holidays all over again. This message is about the tears you cannot uncry. It's about the heart that was either long broken or recently broken that you don't even think can heal again or become unhurt. And it's about the heaviness that you carry around that you may feel like it weighs as much as the weight of the person or the thing, the opportunity, the family, the career, the education, the house. You feel that it weighs as much as whatever you've lost. And that whatever you lost that opened the door wide enough for grief to walk into your life. This message is about grief, but it is about tidings of comfort and joy as well. It is about the grief that walks into your house and takes a seat and you expect it and you talk to it. While you shouldn't even do that, know that you're not alone and you're not not alone because of grief. You're not alone because humans keep doing this. And that's the why of this message, to warn you, to comfort you, to teach you, to tell you, to help you. I see you. Mostly though, God sees you. And I only see you through the eyes of God. I love you. And I'm here to offer you tidings of comfort and joy. Yes, joy, eventually. Believe it, even joy. And although Jesus has come and done his good works in the earth and he's been resurrected and risen to the right hand of the one who sent him, our Father, some of us find ourselves in a world that still needs comfort and it still needs joy. And sometimes that world is our house when we get home from a busy day. Sometimes that world is our house all day because we're not busy. We all need the comforter. God is merciful. He is so good. And the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Isaiah 61, 1. Jesus is the one that will touch and bind and mend hearts. The word of healing is for us, but we still find people who may be caught up in a season that should be joyful when they're supposed to be receiving blessings and blessing others. But maybe they're in grief instead. But then there are people who don't even know their Savior yet. So they are also heavy. But even some Christians are heavy. Some are not having joy. Sometimes even believers find themselves stuck in the same vortex that people who are living in darkness are in needing this comfort and this joy of which I speak. And before we go any further, make sure you are saved and you are one of his, amen. Lord God, I believe that Jesus is the son of God, the only begotten of the father. I believe and confess that Jesus came to earth and died on the cross. And on the third day, God resurrected 
him. I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And I invite him into my heart, into my life today, and I am saved. Thank you, Father. Amen. So the spirit of comfort, the comforter, is the Holy Spirit. And the Bible tells us that Jesus wept. So, therefore, we can too. No reason why we shouldn't, except Jesus tells us not to on certain occasions. But perhaps your loss wasn't very recent. Perhaps it was this time of year, and the memory of it is back. And that memory keeps growing and getting stronger every year. So even it may not even been this time of year of this memory, but maybe it's the first Christmas without mama or the first Christmas without daddy or grandma or the first season without your special person might even be a child. Maybe it's their first the first birthday or first Father's Day, first Mother's Day without your loved one. And there you are flooded with memories. And you just want to be able to separate good memories from the bad ones. You want to separate the ones that lift you up, the ones that make you smile from the memories that bring you down. But we're all human. Sometimes we can't do that. We may start out remembering a funny joke or something they said or a pleasant time we shared, but it may degenerate into a sad moment or a time of the blues. We need the comforter. We could feel a strong disappointment that seems like such a hurdle to get over. It would be a hurdle to get over when you're grief stricken, grief weighs you down. But Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Jesus is saying he has come to do a different thing in you, a different work in you and to help you out in your soul. But if your soul is not strong enough to bear the onslaught of emotions and feelings and grief, then you can be afflicted in your soul because grief comes to oppress you, to press you down, to weigh you down, to make you stagnant and remain in one place. But you've got to rise over those things that are trying to distract you, oppress you, or worse. And how you do that is uniquely you. Prayer, time in the presence of God, hobbies, time spent with good friends, that may inspire you time in the word there is an appropriate time for grieving in the old testament in the case of moses it was 30 days of course the people were going somewhere that's why they had the 30 days they were going through the wilderness to get to their promised land so they couldn't come to a standstill because of excessive grieving I must ask, are you going somewhere in your life? Are you going somewhere in your career, in your family life? Or have you already arrived and you have nowhere else to go? Nothing else to do. If you are still living and moving and having your being, you're needed. You are needed somewhere by someone for something. And let that be, that thing be of God. Amen. In the Old Testament, when Abram's father, Terah, lost a son, Terah stayed in the same place. He stayed in the same place, Ur, and grieved. Grief wouldn't let him leave. But it wasn't until Terah died that Abram left Ur at God's instruction, and Abram's name was changed to Abraham, and Abraham became very great. In the New Testament, Jesus said, Let the dead bury their dead, James 4.14. And the word says man's life is but a vapor. We may think life is dragging on more, not having any fun, but it really does go really fast. So we should keep moving. We should keep moving on to the next moment, the next pinnacle, the next destination point in the Lord. Amen. There are points and places and times and seasons and people all through your life where God has commanded a blessing for you. And some of those places, times, points, seasons, and people, you are the blessing that God has commanded you to be the blessing for someone else. Don't miss your divine appointments. Keep progressing, keep moving. 
You've got to be in the right places at the right times to connect to the right people, to both be a blessing and to lay hold of the blessings that God has in store and plan for you. Amen. But grief is the opposite. Grief wants to defeat you. And one of the ways grief does this is by making you stop and stand in one place for the rest of your life. You need the comforter. Father, Father God, I invite and receive the Holy Spirit in my life today. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit prays for me when I cannot pray for myself. When I'm going through the struggles of life, when I'm in discouragement or frustration or oppressed or at a loss for words, when I don't even know what to say, when I'm down, when I'm lost or feeling overcome, I need you, Lord. I invite and receive your spirit, your Holy Spirit now in the name of Jesus. Lord, help me see where I failed and where I failed and lead me to the changes I need to make in my life. Oh, Holy Spirit, pray with me, pray for me. Be my intercessor today, now in the name of Jesus, as I bring my needs and requests to the Father. I believe I receive in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. So there's grief. Grief has come in to your house, into your life, into your world and taking a seat. And now grief is setting traps for you. I'm warning, this message is a warning, so you'll know the wiles and the tactics of the enemy. So there are grief traps. And God tells us in the Bible not to worry. And that worry becomes a sin for us. And the things that God tells us not to do are things that let the devil into our lives. Worry, fear, doubt, sin, lying, cheating, unforgiveness, bitterness, works of the flesh. Oh, and grief, grief, sorrow, excessive grief and sorrow can also become a sin for us. Sorrow becomes excessive and sinful when it causes us to slight and despise all of our other mercies all of our other joys of our life because we need to see the other mercies that God is bestowing on us and be thankful remain thankful give God praise and still worship him no matter what but ignorance and ingratitude would provoke even our own would provoke us if our natural children did it so how much more do we dare provoke God Sorrows become sinful and over the top when they distract us from work we should be doing, our natural work and the work for the Lord. Grief makes people stand still for a long time. And that's sin. So we're going to pray in a bit against stagnancy in our life because it is one of the traps and the tricks of grief. Another sign of excessive sorrow is when sorrow and grief exceeds its limits. But the afflicted person still must be allowed to observe and feel their grief. We're not telling you not to feel your grief. Go through your process. You must be able to express your grief, express your loss, express it to God and to other humans. But remember, can't nobody do you like the Lord. Nobody can pity you like God. So mostly tell God. In Luke 7, 13, Jesus saw a mourner and Christ sent a word to her and the word of God will heal. It will bind a broken heart. It will renew and restore you. And Christ sent a word to this mourner in Luke 7, 13, and he put a stop to her excessive sorrow. When he saw her, Jesus had compassion on the woman and he said to her, weep not. Weep not weep not weep not weep not weep not and when the Lord saw her he had compassion on her and said unto her weep not When sorrows overload and oppress your physical body and you get sick from grieving, you get sick of grieving, you've gone too far. 
when your body becomes useless or unfit for Christian service because of grief, then you've allowed grief to take you into sin. And doctors will tell you, they'll let you know that grief is one of the chief causes of a life being cut short. I mean, a person can die of a broken heart. You have to not let grief pull you down into the pit. Our hearts should be able to return to center, return to Christ and not remain in the grave with the dead or the deceased or your lost loved one, else your own heart will die. And then it's only a matter of time. And as a note here, I wanna mention the involuntary fast. As a person is going through grief, sometimes they lose their appetite. I mean, that could be a normal process of the grieving, but it could be an involuntary fast that you are now on. And you have to be very careful with it because there is a godly fast, a chosen fast. There's also an evil fast, yeah, which is fast. And if you are not praying and you are not eating, yeah, you could say you're on a diet, but it depends on what you're doing, what you're indulging, what you're allowing into your ear gates, your eye gates, what you're allowing into your world while you're on that fast. That is what is you are you are magnifying. That is what you are building up. So make sure you are praying and praising God and worshiping when you are fasting to make your fast a godly fast. Because if you're in the woe is me state, because you fell there or you put yourself there by programming or by choice, and you're someplace as sorry as you can be and fasting, that fast is unto the devil. And that will make grief able to come in along, among other spirits. But grief will come in and have even a stronger foothold in your life than you could ever imagine. Ingratitude, as I was saying, provokes God. It is dangerous to fall into the hands of an angry God. Don't provoke the Lord your God. Be thankful. Even if you lost something that was very precious to you, be thankful for what God did leave you. Amen. And God gives us peace like a river, but excessive grief and sorrows exceed the bounds of that river, of that God-given peace. And when we walk willingly and continually into sorrow, to renew sorrows, to rehearse them and rehearse grief all over again, and we are idolizing the lost love and the lost person. And it is true that some delight at reminders of their deceased loved one and will incessantly talk about it. And this is like rubbing a wound, picking the flesh again all over again and piercing ourselves all over again to bring up fresh blood. Grief. If you think of grief as a living entity, as demonic as it is, it wants that blood. It is demanding more sacrifice. Don't comply. You need to think of grief like a lion, which loves to play with a person before it destroys that person. So every time you renew your grief, you feed the lion. Sometimes human takes pleasure in bringing up their grief again, their sorrow again, just going into their pity party all over again over their lost anything, truck, tractor, loved one. It's called the blues. Billie Holiday said she ain't had nothing but the blues and she got what she said. Grief is very dangerous because it wants to kill you. Grief works for death and it wants to take you to the same place your lost loved one is. And as a mourner, the mourner wrestles with grief. Sometimes grief gets the upper hand, but Jesus, Jesus can make you victorious over excessive grief and ultimately you'll not be overtaken by it or by death. Please remember, we do not marry in the afterlife. So what you had with that person will not be reduplicated in heaven. The scripture says we will see our loved ones again. 
It doesn't say we're going to marry them again or we're going to be living in the same house with them or doing exactly what they're doing. We have destiny helpers, not destiny spouses. I mean, you may see your loved one again and it may be like, hey, how you doing? And then you may keep it moving to get back on with your eternal work, the work that we're here on earth learning how to do. We're in our training ground, in our training season, and they may need to get back onto their work. So there's really no reason to go where your lost loved one is, even if they are in heaven, and especially if they're not. So let's say a person does go into worry. They go into fear and stress, for example. This opens a spiritual door that should remain shut. Clinging on to, rehearsing old memories that make you unhappy, playing the blues, singing the blues, all about, they're all grief traps. And they all lead to a backward life, backward dreams, backward progress, standstill. <clears throat> standstill is better than backward, I guess, but all of that is sin. Because if you're standing still or going backward, there's no way destiny can be reached because destiny is forward. So we do not relive the pain of things that don't improve or enhance or bring goodness in life and destiny and purpose to fruition. Lord, I come today to ask for the fire of the Holy Spirit to burn off everything in my life that is promoting backwardness, reversal and failure in the name of Jesus. Everything, including grief, anger, laziness, procrastination that is in my life, I bind it and cast it out of my life in the name of Jesus. Lord, reveal to me how I can move forward in life. Open doors for me and give me your divine favor in the name of Jesus. Amen. So if you move into grief and you stay there long enough or too long, the spirit of heaviness comes on you and opens the door for depression. And depression is a pit that is very hard to get out of. Depression is the beginning of death, actually. A soul-tied soul is not of God. And being soul-tied doesn't mean that you're romantic or that you love that person more than anyone or better than anyone else ever could. It has nothing to do with that person. It's you and it's a covenant with the devil. It is a soul tie. And I'm not judging you because I've been soul-tied before. This is how I happen to study about it and learn about it and pray against it in Jesus' name. So being soul tight means your soul is fragmented, either because of a codependence, a problem you have, or it means that your soul or part of your soul has already been captured by the enemy of your soul, the devil. Because we're not supposed to be trading our souls for anything, not anything. And we shouldn't be willing to lose our mind, our will, our intellect to get, have, or be in any relationship because it fragments our soul. I mean, it's not always us. A sudden terror or trauma can also fragment the soul. And a sudden loss can be a sudden trauma. And this could fragment the soul. We will pray. A fragmented soul is easier for the devil to capture. It's easier for him to divide and conquer it. Because your whole soul is powerful. It is something to be reckoned with. Don't be willing to chip it away or let it be chipped away. By being soul tied or lingering in prolonged grief. Because the devil can grab your soul or grab parts of it and put it on sale in the basement of hell. And without your whole soul, you become weaker in spiritual things and the things of God. And that is the plight of a fragmented soul. Grief is a trauma and the devil loves trauma. You can see that message on this channel. He loves any kind of trauma, emotional or physical. And he uses it and gets the doors open to your life to let him in. And sometimes this trauma is in the form of grief, but it can show up in other ways too. The spirit of grief is from the devil, not from God. God is love, not grief. God is loving, caring, merciful, compassionate. He understands grief, but we do have a mandate to move on with life. And we... You know, we are created in God's image and likeness, right? So let's look at God. Let's see how God handled the grief, his own grief in the Bible. Yeah, God has had and has grief. God through Jesus is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He understands our feelings. 
And that's why we can talk to God and he will show you mercy, compassion and pity. He understands how you feel. But every time we sin, it grieves God. So you can't say God doesn't have grief. Every time man sins, it grieves the heart of God. And it repented God that he had made man. Genesis 6, 6. God has suffered losses. And you can't say God didn't lose anything. He lost Jesus, his only begotten son. You know, one of the cruelest memes I've ever seen online is that God got Jesus back. So it's like he didn't lose anything. Let me say that losing Jesus for those three days was a terrible loss. And you as a human, you don't want to lose Jesus for one second. But God also lost all of mankind until Jesus came, until Jesus came to win us all back. And if you're one of the people who doesn't understand what I just said, then you're one of the lost that God is still grieving over. And God is still looking for you and drawing you with loving kindness. He doesn't want one to be lost. Not one. Not one human to be lost. Jesus grieved over the hardness of men's hearts. Mark 3, 5. And in Luke 19, Jesus grieved that Jerusalem had missed the day of her visitation. And we also ourselves can grieve the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 4.30, with a negative talk, our rage, our uncontrolled emotions, lying, stealing, drunkenness. All of that grieves the Holy Spirit. Anytime the Holy Spirit is sending us a word of conviction and reproof and we ignore him, that grieves the Holy Spirit. So we have to go through the motions and the emotions of grief. And accept those emotions, process them, pray and spend time in the presence of God. This is how we're going to get past grief. And God will reestablish some things for mankind when mankind grieves him. And maybe we should do the same. Set some things, set some new order in our lives. Set new order because that's what God would do when he's grieved. Jesus wept. Jesus forgave and then he went on about his father's business. That is a good model for us. The Holy Spirit is kind and merciful and he gives all of us another chance, another chance and another chance until the end of chances. Because God may remove his guardian angel from us if we just continue to have a reprobate spirit, a reprobate mind and keep sinning. And then a guardian demon will stroll right into your life. He'll encourage you to sin more and not repent to drag you down to hell. So, those are the biblical examples that we can use for our edification. And it's okay to grieve. Grief for a season. Express your grief to God. Express your grief, grief with friends and receive comfort from them. Tidings of comfort and joy. Receive good counsel from your friends. If they are compassionate and they have wisdom, if not, you better pick the bones out of that fish they're serving up. Be in grief. It's okay for a season, but don't let the grief get in you. If you're in grief, it may feel like you can't go any lower. Oh, but from here, there is lower. So instead of going lower, there should be a transition, an upturn from the downward spiral of grief Or a person can go lower and lower and lower. There is lower. Long-term grief brings worry and depression. And it's like it just props the door to your heart and your mind open. And the, the enemy of God, the enemy of your soul just can come in at will. Leading you to pine away or wish or yearn that you had your loved one back. And let's say it's a former boyfriend or paramour, girlfriend, husband, wife. And you're just yearning for them back. Now the process of conjuring has begun. The world may call it manifesting. If what you're trying to get is not from God, of God, permitted by God, then it is witchcraft. Pay attention here. If the person you want so badly will not come back and you can't accept it, then you are soul tied. And you've soul tied yourself to them and or the relationship. Now, this may not all be your fault, but 
it may all be your problem. Guys who are out there playing the field, string women along, giving them just enough hope to hang on to and break from them just enough since they know this woman really likes them. So that woman remains hopeful and available. And she becomes a woman in waiting. And this waiting woman may or may not date anybody else believing that one day this Mr. Dude, Mr. Wonderful will be back. It's like a fairy tale. It's like the fairy tales we're forced to listen on, to listen to in our childhood. You know, white horse, handsome prince, happily ever after. Mr. Dude ain't got none of that. Ladies, this is devil work on the part of that man. And I'll tell you right now how. While you're pining away for Mr. Dude, or in the case of your guy, for Ms. Dudette, or your lost loved one, the devil sends in a ringer who we'll call Mr. Magic or Ms. Magic. And one day or night, you see your beloved in your dream life and you can't wait to tell your friends who know little or nothing about dreams. Oh, I saw him in a dream. We were together again. I remind you, angels neither marry nor they're given to marry and neither will those who get to heaven, those humans who get to heaven, Matthew 22, 30. Recall, no graves were dug in this earth until sin entered and none will ever be dug again once sin leaves the world. But graves are dug in the earth because grief is one of the enemies of God that works with death and it wants to pull you into death. So, You think this is great because you don't know anything about dreams right now. So later on in another dream, you're like, oh, we were having a picnic together. And then another dream and then another night, another dream and so on. And so this dream relationship progresses. Next thing you all get married in the dream and you're so excited because this proves to you that he misses you too. And he really loves you. And it proves nothing because that's not Mr. Dude in your dreams. It's a masquerade. And when you want something so bad that it's not of God, you form a soul tie and the devil is in every soul tie, not God. So then there's the next dream and you're getting physical and having relations and it seems so real because it is. And this seems like a very nice solution to loneliness and perhaps your physical needs that you may desperately believe you have and you can't wait for bed at night. You'd rather be alone than with friends right now. It's a juicy secret. And it might just be mind blowing. Yes, it is, but it's demonic. I'm keeping it real here, people. The Bible says to bring your body under. That means your personal physical body. And that's what the fasting is for. So these needs, these desires and these lusts don't take over even in the dream state. And this is why we fast the chosen fast. Or this is why we pray while we're fasting. This is why we pray and continue to serve God and worship God, even in an involuntary fast. I've been called on those myself. They are real. So these emotional and physical needs, they may make you go home after work and have a nice bubble bath, a couple of glasses of wine, maybe even take a sleeping pill. Don't do this. You're doping yourself up. You're dulling your senses. Maybe you own a couple of personal relaxation devices you know, to help you sleep, and you justify it with, well, it's my body. Well, studies show that millions of women do this to help them sleep. The world's report says it's okay. God says it's not. God says it's not okay. Whose report will you believe? And there you were, last night sound asleep, medicated. What went on last night while you were sleeping? You have no idea. It is never a good idea to have no idea of what's going on around you even while you're asleep. And the way you know what's going on around you at night is that you are dreaming and that you get correct biblical interpretations of your dreams. Because the next thing you know, you may be seeing shadows in your house or hearing noises in the night, feeling the bed go down with a weight on it, but no other human being is there with you in the bed. And you can't move or speak. This is called sleep paralysis. This is spirit spouse. And you've conjured, you may have conjured them up yourself with your powerful mind or your desperate needs or in your chronic grief. Spirit spouse doesn't just happen because of grief. There are other ways that show up in people's lives, but it is a common and dangerous path. And it relates to this pining away over a lost relationship, no matter how the relationship was lost. You don't believe me? 
How did those scratches and marks get on your body? Where do they come from? Those bruises. We want to thank God for the comforter. Sorrows may come because we are alive. We can pray. And we can believe and pray that these sorrows and this grief doesn't afflict us as we command our days and nights. If we can stop sinning as much as is possible in us and by help of the Holy Spirit, this will limit sorrows and grief. We can realize that it is a gift to be married to your spouse on this earth, but we will not be married to anyone in heaven except the Lamb of God. Amen. And we can remember that we don't grieve as others do, as those who have no hope. And we'll see our loved ones again. It doesn't say we're going to marry them. And remember when the days of sinning have ended, so will the days of our sorrows. Dear Father, some days it feels like everything is just too hard. Some days we are hurting, we're struggling, fighting fear and worry at every turn. Lord, thank you in the midst of it all, you haven't left us to fend for ourselves. Lord, forgive us for doubting you because you are there. You said you never leave or forsake us. Forgive us when we think you've forgotten us. Forgive us for believing we somehow know a better way. Father, you are truly trustworthy. You are all powerful, mighty God. You are able. You're the Lord of every situation, no matter how difficult it may seem. You are our comforter, our healer. And you never waste the grief that we carry today. Lord, keep excessive grief far away from us. And let the grief that we do have be used for good things in some way. Whatever the enemy meant for our harm, Lord, turn it to good. Anything and everything is possible with you. Nothing is too difficult for you, Lord. Father, we pray for those who grieve today. We pray for ourselves and others. And we ask for your comfort to surround all those who weep, those who mourn. We pray for the peace of your presence to cover our minds and thoughts as you remind us that the enemy can never steal us out of your hands and that you have the final say over our lives. Thank you, Lord, for keeping us safe in your presence forever under the shadow of your wings, whether in life or in death. And we thank you that your ways are higher than our ways and your thoughts are bigger than our thoughts. And we lay it all down at your feet, every burden, every grief, every sorrow, every affliction, every care, every worry, every anxiety, believing that is the safest place for it to be. We love you, Lord, and we need you. We need your fresh grace. In the powerful name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. You can read more on grief in my book, Seasons of Grief, which will be available by a link at the bottom of this video. God bless you.